really the people in New Narrative have the worst reputations, for the writing can get pretty explicit, and the violence of human relationships can make us seem heartless, criminal, but most of us are pussycats under a cruel veneer. <laughs> People act wary when they're around Dennis Cooper, thinking they're part, that he's part of the cult that murders young men in the name of Satan. And they don't realize he's the sweetest guy in a total mensch. I think I have that right, mensch. But with Bruce Benderson, even we used to seeing through the screens of Ecriture to descry the angel within. We were nervous when we heard he was coming to San Francisco to publish, publicize his collection of stories, pretending to say no. I was like, oh my God, he really is evil. We didn't realize that Benderson had already spent more, some gay hippie years in San Francisco as a youth and had in fact published a porn novel under his own name when it was absurd to do so. It was beyond courageous, it was absurd and appeared in the proto-new narrative gay journal Sebastian's Quill in 1972. The interim years had seen him burrowing into the seedy places in New York City. <laughs> I have to laugh, like Times Square. <laughs> the Lower East Side, Alphabet City. The places that are all cleaned up now, but which, even in the 80s, still struck fear into the middle class. Those demamans had become his home while he worked to champion many transgressive writers, the Latin Americans like Manuel Puig, the French perverts like Tony Duver and Pierre Guillotat, whose works he translated. Plus he'd known Camille Paglia in college and uh, had a hundred stories about her. And he had translated Sun and Shadow, the memoirs of Jean-Pierre Aumont, who had married the fiery universal starlet Maria Montez, beloved of Jack Smith. In other words, there was no corner of the degenerate that he had not stepped from, no crumb untasted and brought back in, into his own wild, outspoken writing. And here he is tonight, Bruce Benderson. Kevin and Doty, thank you so much for all the support you've given me over the years. I want to tell you that I love both of you too much. Okay. <laughs> it's a big problem, too. Um, I, I decided to read a, a kinky, degenerate story to live up to uh, uh, Kevin's introduction, but it was much too long, so I've, I've cut it down to about half of what it was. And uh, not to waste time, I'll start now. It's called Convalescence, and it was published by Red Dust Press. Within a year, I felt confident enough to return to normal life. I had planned to take up again the profession of scholar, which I'd abandoned for almost a decade in favor of my addiction. Fortunately, I chanced upon an unusual opportunity. A disabled French scholar, whose name had meant a great deal to me in my youthful academic days, had placed a small ad in a journal asking for a temporary assistant. He was a specialist in a fin de siècle writer known for his decadent excesses and for a later zealous conversion to conservative Catholicism. Within a week, my letter had been answered and arrangements were made for my voyage to the French Alps, where the scholar was now living in a sanitarium. It was in the mountains, 50 miles from Grenoble, that the scholar had been sent for a lengthy, perhaps terminal, convalescence. The tumor that had shrunk him to skeletal proportions had not responded to treatment, and the disease had spread to the rest of his body. Racked by toothaches and migraines, the famous scholar of the infamous late 19th century yellow book writer found himself following in the footsteps to Calvary of the very man who had been the object of his lifetime of study. For that man had himself spent his last years in excruciating pain while living near a monastery as an oblate. This mirroring process was merely the last cycle in a series 
considering that the late 19th century writer, who was the subject of my employers to be study, had himself emulated medieval sages, among them the formidable alchemist and monster Gilles de Ré, who had once fought beside Joan of Arc. After writing his treatise on Gilles de Ré, the writer had also undergone an intense religious conversion in hopes of avoiding the bestial urges that had come with too much familiarity with Gilles de Ré's bloodthirsty practices. But even his pious impulses had taken on a sumptuous tinge that could have been described as decadent or lurid. With a pounding heart, I swerved through the mute landscape of rock, grass, and patches of snow up a peak close to Mont Blanc, whose razor silhouette could actually be glimpsed from time to time through the crab apple trees. A wind seemed to exploit, explode their blossoms from the branches, spraying them against my windshield. The exhilaration I felt for the first time since my addiction reawakened my hope that I had not broken all libidinous ties to the world, but could once again vigorously partake in the pleasures of sensuality. Soon I reached the mountain peak and the sanitarium, hosted in a former monastery and currently staffed by nuns. Here, illnesses of all persuasions, from tuberculosis to AIDS, were reduced, if not in theory, at least in sensibility, to the same context of original sin. And no one questioned the sick person's duty or right to the correct, nearly silent life of the terminally ill Catholic. The kinds of discussions that tend to establish hierarchies in a community weren't considered meaningful here, as all had been reduced to the identical final stage. Within this sobering atmosphere, I was brought to the professor, an emaciated man with wispy, transparent hair and an inflamed, peeling face. Pulling himself up from a carved wooden chair by means of a walker, he extended a limp hand. He was, he said, anxious to take a ride down the mountain up which I had just come, and without so much as another word struggled from the room, signaling me to follow. We were intercepted by one of the nuns, who in cautionary tones reminded him that the obligatory luncheon was about to be served, and went so far as to lead us away from the outside doors and into the dining room. She barely was able to look into the professor's face, seeming to find some kind of unholy terror in the sight of his emaciation. When we were finally allowed to begin our afternoon drive, my employer was bundled into his Scottish shawl and pushed toward the exit in a wooden wheelchair. We moved briskly across the polished floor of the dim corridor, broken at regular lengths by squares of harsh light coming through window panes and wooden doors, which reminded me in a melancholy way of those in pre-war elementary school classrooms. When we finally were outside, the nun who'd been pushing the wheelchair was immediately replaced by a scruffy local of about 13 who jumped abruptly onto our path. He had a flattened female, feline snout and a big impudent smile that would have looked like a leer on an older person. I hope you won't mind including my little friend in our downward jaunt, said the professor, whose words sounded like an incantation. Immediately the boy grabbed the wheelchair with dirty calloused hands and trotted toward the parking lot with it. At the car, the boy lifted the frail professor out of the wheelchair and into his wiry arms. There was a wolfish gleam of content in the professor's eyes as he gazed with happy familiarity at the boy, who seemed, surprisingly enough, to return the look, if a bit impishly. I snatched a quick, rather peeved look at his lanky frame, and I climbed into the driver's seat. I took in his thick, peltish black hair and his flawless skin, which was so pale that the circles under his mean-looking, almond-shaped eyes seemed bluish 
His famished cheeks formed two shadows over a gleaming, impudent mouth and a tiny pink tongue that nervously kept it lubricated. The air became heavier and the light denser as I steered the car down the spiraling mountain road, waiting for my employer to broach the subject of work. As I rounded each curve, he swayed slightly, one raw red claw weakly gripping the dashboard. At the moment, it seemed as if everything were about to gel irrevocably into frozen silence. He ventured a comment. Spring has come late this year and then lapsed again into autism, staring passively at the brilliant, glittering landscape rushing by, almost as if he were aware that his suffering both welded him to unstoppable outpourings of nature and at the same time forbid him any real enjoyment of it. Strangely enough, we were passing a cafe named Le Relais, a word that can refer to a relay race or a truck stop, but also implies refreshment or renewal based on the assumption that we are living in a reality riveted by relentless beginnings. I backed up until the car was in front of the cafe. Would the professor mind wasting a few moments for a drink? I asked timidly. We could sit on the terrace and talk about the research he wanted me to help him with. <clears throat> He climbed painfully from the car with the boy's help, testily warning me. You cannot trust their aperitifs here. Too much stem and leaf, not enough fruit. We sat at an outdoor table under the sinking sun where we ordered those aperitifs and where I was sure that he would begin to discuss our project. Our small terrace was situated on a kind of esplanade cut into the slope of the mountain near a torrent and a harsh light pierced us obliquely, as if nailing us in our tables and chairs to their shadows. I brought up the subject of the manuscript yet again, but the professor interrupted me with a nearly phobic insistency. Nobody seems to recall <clears throat> that his most extravagant flights of inspiration were the result of his dangerous liaisons with lowlifes, he said about the writer we would be researching. No one remembers how he broke his ties with the suffocating world of the ever fatter, more banal bourgeoisie. Piped through the chasm of stone in which we were seated, his words mixed with the rush of water in the torrent and took on a giddy, brittle intensity that pulverized my attention into anxiety. The more he veered from what I consider our main subject, the more perplexed, distressed, and suspicious about the professor's mental state I became. Despite my evident discomfort, his chatter rushed monotonously from him like the torrent, endlessly spattering me with staccato insistency, his head darting about like a bird and his eyes fixing from time to time on the boy. He's a local, said the professor, flashing a knowing look at me that I couldn't interpret, while the boy bit at the dirty nail of one hand and peered at us from the edge of his glass of watered-down white wine. In fact, he's something of a casualty. Suddenly, the boy resolutely and noisily sucked the rest of the wine down. <clears throat> the professor moved his eyes away from him and focused on the snow-capped peak of Mont Blanc in the distance, touched by the setting sun. Speaking of snow, he blurted out, are you a devotee of Ufa la Neige? I wish we could talk about the research I'll be helping you with, I said. <clears throat> For a moment, his eyes refocused, and he asked me how comfortable I was with the colloquial non-literary French of that period, but again veered abruptly into a wistful description of the boy's Alpine dialect which resembled what they spoke just over the border in Italy, <clears throat> on the other side of Mont Blanc, where most of the names ended in AZ and where one could visit the city of Aosta, a name that is a corruption of Augustus, as in Caesar. I listened tensely, trying to deny to myself that his sudden swerves of context were symptoms of a mental deterioration. For the first time, I noticed a woman sitting at a nearby table, her eyes cast to her feet, and I remembered that this was a mountain of more than one sanitarium. 
including one for the mentally ill. Her eyebrows had been redrawn on her face and she was wearing a turban, perhaps to conceal a hairless cranium. She's from the sanitariums, said the professor, catching my gaze with a kind of eerie satisfaction. You mean they let them drink? The professor did not bother to respond. Then I heard myself insisting that we leave, that we had better go back up the peak before the sun set. With a shrug, the professor pushed himself to an unsteady standing position and took the boy's arm with his claw of a hand. By the time I'd started the car, some of my annoyance had subsided. In an attempt to establish some context of conversation between myself and the professor, I said, they're rather severe up there at the sanitarium, aren't they? They run the place like a convent. Have you gotten to know any of the other um, guests? One woman who has a blood disease, the professor replied flatly. We took a chair to the mountain peak once. She keeps her distance now. I'm sure she's told some of the other patients what I have. The tone astonished me. It was cautious, almost conspiratorial, to the hint of a boast. I turned onto the road a bit rudely, and the professor was jerked forward. The frail, raw hand was again extended to grasp the dashboard. The boy in the back seat tumbled sideways and let out a rude, boisterous laugh. You must stop this driving, said the professor suddenly. It's making me ill. And indeed, he did seem to have a new pallor underneath the red, peeling skin. I parked in front of the next cafe and went around to the other side to help the professor from the car. He took my wrist and pulled me forward, and the boy followed us as if participating in a game. It was a tawdry, boisterous cafe, with workers in caps and woolens sprawled along the zinc counter, overloaded with pastis or beer, as well as some local teenagers arguing by a pinball machine, and some blousy women who may have been prostitutes, and moved back and forth between the bar and some of the tables to cajole a few sullen-looking men who sat drinking alone. I maneuvered the professor to a table as far away from the music and hubbub as possible. Where did all these drunks come from, I said irritably. They're from the sanitarium, mostly, <laughs> replied the professor with the same eerie satisfaction. This time I did not say, you mean they let them drink? Perhaps oiled by the cognac, the professor himself had ordered, he began to talk about her work. He said the reason he'd asked me if I was familiar with the vernacular of that period is because we'd be working on a handwritten manuscript from Lyon, one of a kind that did not rely upon literary language. You'll need a bit of courage to face it, said the professor, a trace of irony compressing the corners of his mouth. It was secretly culled, I suspect, by our author from a certain cult hiding in the slopes of Lyon, which was, as you must know, the mystical center of France. Oh, did he use it to research his great novel of the lower depths, I asked? The professor shook his head and, as he had established a precedent to do, ignored my wondering glance. <laughs> Those slopes above the rivers of Lyon, he went on, where they were notorious for sheltering brigands, fugitives, and especially enemies of the church. And what is described in these pages? Well, not even the successor to the prophet Eugene Vintras, the formidable Abbe Boulon, who successfully applied poultices of excreta to psychic wounds and compelled nuns to drink their urine for their own protection, ever spoke of the practices discussed in these pages. Monsieur, please. The man who said this was standing before our table. He was squat and floored with powerful arms in his 60s, a scar on his weathered neck. You're from the sanitarium, aren't you? Would it trouble you to take me with you back to the top? It's getting late, isn't it, said the professor. Yes, come with us. We should all be heading back. The man fixed me in his frank gaze. You'll be leaving now, or will you give this old timer a moment for another pastiche? <laughs>
Have your pasties, friend, said the professor in a voice suddenly gracious and relaxed before I could say anything. We don't mind waiting. The drinker grinned, showing inflamed gums, and offered the three of us to join him, but we refused. Promising not to be a moment, the man mounted a bar stool, ordering a pastis for himself, as well as for a certain Marie, a middle-aged woman exploding with curls and clasping a Pekingese. Was it my recent experience with recovery that so soured my reaction to the sight of a sick man downing a pastis while indulged by a local prostitute? When our passenger reapproached moments later, he was weaving dangerously. He stumbled after us to the car and sat next to the boy in the back seat. However, I had not made more than two or three hairpin turns up the mountain toward the sanitarium before the professor complained of my driving again and commanded me to stop. <clears throat> As for our new passenger, he had fallen into a noisy snooze his head tilted back against the seat behind us. As we sat in the car by the side of the road, I noticed the sky darkening. In fact, it would be night in another half hour. A tense silence seemed to have crept with the darkness into the car. As it did, I thought I heard the breathing of the professor deepen into relief. The boy began to hum a mindless tune to himself. The drunken local woke up and gazed around in confusion. Some intuition seized him. With a look close to panic, he quickly thanked us and said he preferred to walk the rest of the way, opened the car door and nearly leapt out, then staggered up the road. The boy went back to the humming of his mindless tune. Over and over, its empty little intervals spilled into the darkness. And with each degree of darkness, the tune got slower and more deliberate. Then a flashlight pierced the trees, a fist wrapped on the window next to the professor's face. I bent over him to wind the window down, and a middle-aged man poked his head into the car. Has your car broken down, he said. He was porcine and ruddy, and in the darkness above his turtleneck, floated a fat neck and a falsely solicitous smile. I couldn't help thinking of the quote, ever fatter, more banal middle class, unquote, the professor had grumbled about. <clears throat> Have you had a breakdown, he asked again. The boy lunged forward from the back seat and grabbed him by the head, managing to roll up the window to wedge it within the frame. <laughs> the professor sank his teeth in above the turtleneck. The neck struggled and dug against the window's edge, but the boy kept it jammed in place. Tremblingly, the old man drank his fill, while the stranger's face changed from coagulated red to ashen gray. The professor fell back against the seat and smiled beatifically. His mouth was crimson and dripping. So many things that were known have been forgotten, he said, as if explaining. His ancient face convulsed into a rictus of laughter, which shook his body with such force that I was afraid his ribs would snap. The effort had to have been too much for him because it was caught off suddenly. His head fell to his chest and his body crumbled against the car door as if he were unconscious or dead. Blood trickled like rivers of liberty and appetite from the pallid neck attached to the lifeless head lodged in the window frame. The boy bent forward to take a drop of it onto the tip of his finger, brought it to his mouth, but suddenly stopped midway and sweetly extended it toward my face. His pointy tongue flicked back and forth seductively from the wet hole of his gleaming mouth. Thank you.